It is a lie for you to believe that God puts anything but good on you. God is good. Amen? And is God perfect? So if God is good and perfect, does he take the devil and say, okay, devil, you go over there and make my kids love me more by harassing them. But yet we hear in the body of Christ that false teaching. And the way, we, the way that Christians get that is to get it out of the Old Testament. What was the situation in the Old Testament that you and I have in the New Testament that they didn't have? Jesus inside of us. You see? So God doesn't put you through the mud in the crud nor the flood. He's not doing that. That's the devil. You got to learn to stand up, take authority over him. Got to learn to walk in Jesus. And listen. You've got to get to church where you can get the training, the good training that you need, not what I call the, the psychology of oblivious. What do you mean by that, Pastor Gary? Well, sometimes you go to a church and they'll say, this is what we need to do, so these are the steps that we need to take to do them in. How many ever heard good teaching like that? That's good teaching, but the trouble with that teaching is it appeals to the mind. And not to the full heart. You see, there's 15 inches between your head and your heart. And 15 inches could destroy you. Because the Bible says, trust in the Lord and lean not to your own under. So where's that deal with? So when it comes to your Christianity, what I have to share with you today is going to be a wonderful thing. We're celebrating Labor Day. Amen. Those that labored before us and gone on. If you want to read about them, they're in Hebrews chapter 11. But see, we have a thing that Christians need to avoid. Look at somebody and go, really? <laughs> I, I call it this. Maybe you have another name. It's called mental assent. In other words, you agree with the Bible mentally, but when it comes down to it, you really got to believe the Bible in faith. And many Christians today, not picking on you. Remember, this is not a church where you get picked on. This, this is a church where you get trained. But many Christians today are trying to harass and try to do things in their understanding. For example, they're working really hard to be a Christian. Now, if I look at you, don't get nervous. It doesn't mean I'm talking to you. <laughs> I have to move my eyes around into the camera, Okay. But I have very piercing eyes, and especially when I'm preaching. I mean, you can, and when I speak, when the Spirit of God speaks out of me, again, I'm telling on the God part of me. It comes, and there's power in it. So if that happens to you, and you're new, which you are, don't get nervous. We love you. Okay, so back to the understanding. A lot of Christians don't know it, but Satan works hard on trying to get us to reason our Christianity. To get to a place of trying to figure things out. You ever done that? So I'm working hard, Sherry. Trying to get God to love me and trying to get God's blessings upon my life. What's wrong with that? I'm working. I'm working. I got the idea. I, 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 I. You see? And so Satan's a master at manipulating human beings to get him out of faith and trust in God to move us into mental reasoning. And that's where fear can get in. That's where uh, dissension can get in. Get in the mind. Have you ever thought somebody was mad, with, mad at you? And then you talked to them and you found out it was true? So don't trust your mind all that much. Can you say amen? Lest you steep it in the word of God. All right. Today's lesson, because of Labor Day, is created... For good works. I know. I know. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said I know. Now let's read our scripture for today. I always leave it up until I get going. So, All right. So here's our scripture for today. And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ in him crucified. Somebody asks you, hey, 
you got some Bible answers? What you just, no, just say, I just know Jesus died and crucified for me. Stay humble. And then I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit of power. Then the verse 5 says that your faith not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Where does our faith stand? In the power of God, not the wisdom of men. I can speak some eloquent words for you. And I've been to Bible college, and I've had all those things. But without the power, we can't be transformed. Can you say amen? So good morning, church. You are the blessed people of God. You're the happiest people on earth. And maybe you should let your face know it. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Did you ever ask the question, why was I created? What is my purpose? I believe we were created for companionship to be with God. God would come down in the cool of the day and we'd visit with Adam and Eve, wouldn't he? And I believe God really wants that with you and I. And if you think of all the things that he's laid out in the scripture, that's exactly what he did. At Pentecost, he came into the earth. And those that accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, he came and tabernacled inside of them. So say, inside of me dwells God. Let me not forget that. Inside of me, say it again, dwells God. I need to trust him more than my mind. So the idea is, teaching of the word of God is getting you to realize who you really are in Christ, not what religion says you are, or what people think by their opinion. Are oh, you Christians, all you need is a crutch, and that's why you accepted Jesus Christ. You needed a crutch. And I look at him, and I smile and laugh, and I says, you know, crutch? With a crutch, I can limp to heaven. But see, Jesus is a stretcher. He has to carry me there. And he has to carry you there too. It's not by our own works. It's by our obedience. Our works follow our faith in God. Say amen. So this lesson is created for good works. Open your Bible to Matthew, the ninth chapter, please. And as you do that, let me finish my uh, paragraph. As we follow Jesus Christ... God wants to reveal to us so the eyes of our understanding become enlightened, Ephesians 1, so that we may know what is our call, what is our hope, what God has for us. Can you say amen? You see, when you go to look for a car, how many ladies have ever been to a car lot? Just the ladies. Did you feel a little intimidated there, kind of? Unless you had it, you know. Come on, be honest. You could be intimidated there. Think about the Christian that doesn't know anything, barely understands who they are in the Lord, and then they're in the big, big situation, and they're thrown into a situation in their life. How should they handle it? Through the Word of God. But what if they don't know the Word of God? Then we want to give them the Word of God. Can you say amen? And so as Christians, you and I should be asking what do I need to do for this? What do I need to do for that? I, I need to have understanding about that. How about my prayer life? Why is it sometimes it seems prayer is so hindered or not answered? Can you give me these questions? People are not asking the right questions. They're scared. Well, we should know all these things ourselves. Listen, the Bible says that God has given you apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, that you be thoroughly equipped and furnished for every good work. That's you. And so my job is to give you the word so that you can act on the word of God and become the champion God purposed and planned for you to be. Say amen, somebody. Instead of going to church and getting picked on or be told what you're doing wrong, how about being shared what you could do right so that you and Jesus can work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? Say amen. All right, Matthew 9. Get this? Now, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, 
he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. You see, everyone needs to be led. Amen? And there's one head on your shoulders, not three. So you don't run your life by a committee, I hope. <laughs> you let you surrender and you let God help plan your life. Can you say amen? And just follow up. God is so exciting. I've never had so much excitement in my entire life. The first mission I went on, I met a three-headed snake. I was told by God to go on to this forest fire. I was a Department of Natural Resource fire man, training in the summer. So they sent us on a forest fire, and I had known nothing about it. But God says, you're going over there not just to fight fires, but you're going over as a witness for me. I said, great. And when I went over that, at first adventure I went on, I would call it my first missionary trip. First thing that greeted me when I got off the bus was a three-headed snake saying, I'm going to kill you. Now, you get a brand new baby Christian, you put him in that situation, woo, and they'll be crying, mama. Okay? But listen, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Why would I share something like that? Because Satan doesn't want to make your walk with Jesus easy. So all of the the, the, the grinding and all the tight, tightness and everything that comes your way, we know it isn't God sending it. So what could we do with that? We could take authority over it. So you know what I did with that three-headed serpent? I rebuked him with all my voice. These people are all looking. We have a forest fire. It's 3.30 in the morning. I come out of the shack with my sleeping bag and I... And my suit, my boots in my hand, and I said, I'll remember you, Satan, with all that I can do. <laughs> this thing is... <laughs> and I'm going, I guess God has a mission for me. Let me encourage you that I'm not any more special than you are. I might be a pastor, but every one of you are a supernatural being with God. Get up in the morning and tell them, Lord, it's you and I. It's going to be an adventure today, a good one. Now, I wonder what's going to go wrong today. <laughs> we ever done that? Yes, we have. Okay, so let's move on. You got it? So he said, he healed all their sick, and he was with, moved with compassion for them because they were weary, scattered sheep, having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, who's he talking to? Yeah, his disciples, not everybody, just his disciples. The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. In other words, God needs more laborers out there. Can you say amen? Now, I don't know about you, but I have this beautiful peach tree over here. And this year, we got so many peaches on it. I mean, I have a branch with probably 150 peaches on it. I mean, it was God. Oh, Pastor Kerry, it was just one of those years. See how we are? <laughs> no, God loaded that peach tree. And my wife and I will tell you, we could not trim it. I could not cut it and I cut it back because my tools have not been operating properly. And so... Naturally filled all up. And guess what? All the top branches broke. So the tree looks. And you say, what's the deal? The harvest is truly plentiful. But we don't have enough peach pickers. <laughs> Can you say amen? And if you watch, the harvest is growing around here. Which of us are going to be laborers in the vineyard? Amen. Can't be Linda and I all the time. Can't be Danny and his wife all the time. We all need to labor. Why? Because that's how growth happens. Amen. Let's get the peaches out. Can you say amen? All right. So Jesus says, the harvest is truly ripe. The laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest that he sent forth laborers. Everyone say amen. A couple of points. Now, point number one, it is God's desire that none perish. Can you say amen? No, not one. Jesus knows the harvest needs laborers. And that we must train up as children of God to know what to do. 
Can you lead somebody in the sinner's prayer? Two, God created us to share the gospel and to do good works. Amen. When you do a good work, people usually say, wow, that's neat. And then you get to tell them who's the one who helped you do that good work. And thirdly, Jesus Christ is our example that Jesus Christ, how he was anointed by God, full of the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good, doing good, and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him, Acts 10.38. First point, God created us for good works. Everyone look at somebody and say, I'm good. Now, I don't know about you, but the world does not teach us good lessons. Now, I happen to be fortunate to have some good parents. They weren't perfect. They weren't saved. But my parents did get saved finally. But they were good parents. They taught me things like my dad would say, go get the belt. <laughs> I knew what that meant. And me going get the belt gave me time to repent. So when I got the belt, he says, I can see you already repented. So the idea is what you need to know is that when we were sinners, when we were in the world, you were an enemy of God and you didn't know it. Yet you're a potential child of God. And then when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, stop Comparing yourself to the Old Testament until you understand who you are in the New Testament. Why? Because you're going to get under the law. The law was designed to kill people. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? Well, what do the Jewish people do? They came to Moses and said, Moses, you tell God, ah, we can do anything. Moses went up. I believe that Moses really was expecting to get instructions to lead them through the wilderness. But instead, Moses went up there and God seen what they do, a golden calf, doing the old selfish thing, telling God what they're going to do. Have you ever told God what you're going to do? <laughs> Thank God you're not in the Old Testament. <laughs> and he goes up there to receive instructions and God says, Ten Commandments. What were those Ten Commandments written for? Now, listen, I'm not putting them down. Now, listen, what were those Ten Commandments? Most Christians, if you don't get this, You'll mess up your Christianity. Those Ten Commandments were meant to nail your flesh to the cross. I'm going to sit here on that. What do you mean? Well, the Jewish people thought they could save themselves. How many here think you can save yourself? So the Ten Commandments were the thou shall not. Listen to me. Don't throw this out. This, many Christians miss this. The Ten Commandments were given to the Jewish people to let them know they needed something more to keep those commandments. And the something more they needed was Jesus, who was coming. Funny thing, though, when Jesus showed up, they crucified him. Wasn't what a fine greeting. <laughs> so you can see the danger of us without a God. How we can kill people how we can murder babies. We need Jesus. And you need Jesus a lot more than you think you do. You do not have a handle on things like you think you do. Okay? Because you've got a devil that you do wrestle with. And he's been there working on humanity for over 6,000 years. He knows all the lies. All the cons. So the best thing you do, and we're going to get to this, is you don't fight the enemy yourself. You bring Christ up. Now, did Jesus destroy the enemy? Did Jesus whip the enemy? Come on, you guys, you're supposed to know something. Yes. Does he live in you? Well, then what are you doing letting the devil trick you? Right? We all said, oh, Pastor Curry, you know, we get into the head again. Stop. Can you sense something was about to happen in our midst? Somebody right now in their wrist is being healed of corporal tunnel or something. Get to moving your hand in Jesus' name. 
the word went forth and it healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. Can you believe? When the people came to Jesus, did you come to meet Jesus today? Well, we did, didn't we? You don't need to be saved. You didn't come to get saved. You came to know more about Jesus. Well, why not Jesus let him heal your body? Went to a Catholic meeting one time down here at the fairgrounds. Remember, Jesus Northwest, when it first started, was down at the fairgrounds here in Puyallup. And I went to see a Catholic priest who got filled with the Spirit, and he was a charismatic. And it's all relate. Okay, so relate. And there was a whole bunch of people there in the audience that were beat down, and they were actually infirm. Something needed to be healed in their body. And what Jesus did is, or what this guy did is, he says, I'm, Jesus is right here to heal us, but I've got you to, to remove the blockage. Will you remove the blockage? And everybody says, yeah, what's the blockage? He says, will you think in your heart for just a minute, is there somebody you're mad at? Can you forgive them right now? When he did that, everybody that had something broken or something wrong with them were healed all at once. And I went, wow. And you see, sometimes healing is not the fact that God doesn't want to heal us. Sometimes we have blockages we need to make sure they're not there. Say amen. amen. We were created for good works, can you say amen? To do good, to encourage one another. All right, so, so Ephesians chapter 2, look at this. 4 through 10, I'll read rather quickly. Okay, but God who is rich in mercy... Because of his great love, wherewith he has loved us, say, I'm loved. Even when we were dead in trespasses and sin, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Do you know the difference between mercy and grace? Mercy is God not giving you what you do deserve, and, and grace is God giving you what you don't deserve. Think about it. Only briefly, I don't want you in your head too much. <laughs> I love you guys. You're so serious. Okay. All right. So, amen. Just, just throw, after, after church today, just throw one at me. It's okay. All right. So, listen to what it says, okay? By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit. Everyone say Sit. Sit down in Christ. Say it. Sit down in Christ so he can work. As long as we're working, God rests. As long as we're resting, God works. For there is a rest to the people of God, Hebrews 3 and 4, but some won't enter in it because they're doing it for God. And listen, it's okay to do it for God, but make sure God told you to do it. <laughs> It'd be terrible if I, I'm pastoring, Linda, and God didn't tell me to do it. <laughs> Several pastors around the area, they're not pastors at all, but they have wonderful gifts and they're, they're heroes. So everybody sticks them on the office of leadership. Listen, if the quarterback doesn't love Jesus, don't put him as the leader of the team. Often as Christians in churches, we put people because of their talents in positions of doing things, yet they're not spiritually mature enough to handle the pressure the enemy puts on them. Remember new level, new devil? Hello? So when God promotes you, he expects you to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Satan actually believes that you guys are going to be doing the word. He believes it. So he comes to see if you're going to do it or not. And if you do, you're going to wipe them out every time. But what, what happens is we sit. Our mind is not here. We're thinking about this. We're thinking about that. We don't get the word. It was in our holding fast to it. Jesus said, hey, you got ears? Let them hear. Amen. Let them hear. He's bringing in something supernatural that you have to really pay attention to so he can get us out of here. 
He says, my sheep will hear my voice and I will lead them out. Amen? Hey, you're on the Titanic. And Jesus says, over here, kids. I got a way out. Guaranteed, you'd be there. Come to church, kids. He's got the way to teach you out. All right? So let's move on. Now, catch this. This is so good. For we are seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For we are his workmanship. You are his masterpiece is another word. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Amen. So you got a package of good works in you. Say amen. His name is God. He's just biting at the bit to flow out of your words, to flow out of your thoughts, to help your eyes see the way he sees so that when you're involved in something, it comes out good. It always has a healing expression. Did you know this church, people get healed in this church without hands laid on them. I want it that way. I don't want them to have faith for my hand. I want them to have faith where they sit. If you pull your back out and you're fishing, I want you to have faith to receive your back in and enjoy the rest of your fishing. That's revival. It's not a bunch of jumping and everybody scatters out and nobody knows anything and it just shut down really quick. That's what happened with just about every revival up until now. But now we have the word. Can you say amen? We build our life upon the word. We don't build it upon our mental ascent. We build a life upon God. We meet with him on a daily basis. And then he takes us and restores us with the canker womb and the, and the evil of this world has tried to destroy. Some of you are just like me. The drugs, the things that whacked on you when you were younger. Now God wants to restore all that. Put some brain cells back into your brain. Can I blow your mind with something? Did I, was I too loud? I, I didn't scare anybody, did I? Did you know, you sitting there, you're as old as 11 years old. That's as old as you are. What do you mean by that? I'm going to blow your mind. Every 7 to 11 years, all the cells of your body exchange. You have a complete new cell system in your body every 7 to 11 years. So every 7 to 11 years, you become you again. See, it's called a recycle. Now, what you don't know is that every cell after that, 7 to 11 years, a weaker. That's what causes us to age. So every 7 or 11 years, okay, that's one cycle, and then boom, you go into another cycle, and the cells in that cycle are weaker. So we look older. How many didn't know that? You say, so as soon as you got past 11, you started dying. But yet, the Bible says, we shall not die. We shall live forever. Amen. And even though, listen, our outward man is perishing, it grows weaker. Our inward man, when we walk with God, is renewed day by day. Woo! You walk with Jesus, you're going to look younger. You go look at some of my pictures five years, six years old, when I went through all of that. Felt like everybody and their brother left, except for my wife and a few of my relatives. And I'm feeling like you know, maybe it's all over and I look like hell. Excuse the expression. Terrible. And then you get to follow on Jesus and sparkle comes back in your eye. A kick comes back in your step. This is what we need to be looking at. Not why we're going through things. No, as long as we're in the valley of the shadow of death, this fallen earth, the Bible says you will fear no evil. Why? Because we're containers of God. It says, because God is with us. Woo! Man alive. We can sit down anywhere and have a feast with God and laugh at the devil. Well, I, I, I wouldn't laugh at the devil. That's because maybe you need to know God more. I laugh at him every day. 
Because some of the dumb stuff he suggests. Moving right along. <laughs> Couple of points. One, now that we are born again, we have God where? Okay, and where are you too? You're sitting here, but where are you? So remember I said sit down? So here's how it works. You accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says, come unto me, Jesus said. And if you're weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. In other words, hook up, belt yourself to me. Ribbit yourself to me. So when I lead, you'll follow right along and I'll walk you through your life the way it's supposed to be and show you the better ways to do things, the quicker way, the wiser way, the healthier way. I will begin to walk with you and you and I will become friends. How many here want that? Put your hand here. Put them both up. Say, thank you, Lord. You're friends of God. You're so well equipped. The only thing you got going against you is your flesh and your mind. And that's why our flesh needs to be subjected to God, laid on the altar, and our mind needs to be renewed so we can reprogram the old Trash 80. Remember the Trash 80 computers came out? You know? Huh? Amen. A little Donkey Kong, you know? But you know, notice things are a little more advanced. Well, you never had a Trash 80 except for when you were in the world. You have God who's wiser than anyone, who's smarter, who's more powerful, and he is on your side. You see, the preaching that we've heard for years and years and years is, you never know, God might be against you. Oh, yeah. You got to watch. Look what happened to the Israelites. They started mouthing off and the ground opened up and swallowed them. And we get to reflecting in the Old Testament, forgetting that God lives in us. And it's the vacillation of going to the Old Testament to the New. Old Testament New. Old Testament New. And you see cults out there doing that. And they're sick all the time. And they're broken all the time. Because the Old Testament didn't offer much healing. It had it. But you had to go through the priest. Well, you and I have the priest in us. We don't have to go through anybody. When you say, Father, I need to be healed, you believe that you receive it and healing is now working. Now, shut your head down, watch your lips because you'll start talking against that because you don't see any results with your eyes. You see, when our faith Paints the picture brighter and clearer than what we can think healing is ours. When you can see yourself healed, when your mind says, oh, I don't know, when your faith can see yourself healed, you just reach up and take it because it's yours. The trouble is we don't see ourselves healed. We see ourselves hoping to be healed. I certainly hope God's going to favor me this week. Now, I'm just kidding with you a little bit, but you see how really religious that sounds? That sounds pretty cool. Oh, you know, brother, you never know, Scott, what God's going to do. His wonders perform. Yes, you do. If you sit with God, he says, I will show you things to come. You say, well, how come he has not shown me things to come? Maybe you ought to sit a little longer. Don't get mad at me. I... I Back when I first was saved, praying an hour was nothing. Sometimes we prayed three or four hours. All at once, Pastor Kerry? No, not all at once. We pray, read, pray, read, pray, read. Why? At that time, I was unemployed. All I knew is my job was to get so close to God, God and I would be one. You have the same promise. How bad do you want that? How bad do you want to see your family come back together? You better spend time with the one that can do that. Stop trying to figure things out. Stop trying to watch yourself all the time. Get in there and get instructions from God. Get in the word so you understand what the weaponry is. And then stand up and let Jesus pulverate the enemy. Sit down in Christ. Learn from him. Stand.
stand up, having done all to stand, stand and walk with Christ. But until you sit down, you're an open bait. Because when you don't sit down, and when you make the decisions, you're out in front of God where you can be shot with darts. Hello. All right, everybody got it this, this far? Say amen. <laughs> Let's get on with this. So take off the limits, folks. My next point, take off the limits in your mind. All things are possible to him that Come on, let's say it together. All things are possible to him that believes. Did Jesus say that? Yes. Did he mean it? No, he was just kidding. <coughs> Take off the limits. Trust God. Ephesians 3, look at this, verse 20 and 21. We're going to go quite fast now. Watch. This, follow the scripture. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. Boy, take the limits off. According to the power that works where? Where's the work? Where's the power working? In us. Stir it up. Little darling, stir it up. Amen? Amen. Stir up the gift that's within you. So it isn't really the enemy doing all that to you. It's just maybe you didn't hear you could do that. And maybe you thought you could, but it was, you know, long time in between the time you heard it the first time and the time you heard it now. You need to stir God up. And you have, I, have, I hate to use this, but you have channels God wants to come out of. Your mouth. He wants to come out. Did you know I used to line people up and I close my eyes and I look at them and the power of God come out of my eyes and knock them all down on the floor. Remember seeing all that? Yeah. I used to do all kinds of experiments like that and then I realized that people started lifting me way up, you know, thinking that I was really something special. I'm not something special. You are. A pastor wants his congregation to be more special and more anointed than himself. It's like you. Well, you want your kids to be better than you, right? I mean, which, which spirit would never want that? So pastors want that. A good pastor would want you to get everything you can get and be encouraged along the way getting it. Can you say amen? All right, so now to him who's able to do exceedingly above or beyond anything we can ask or think, according to the power of the works in you, to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So we are believers indwelt by God. Never forget that. My next point is work out your own salvation. Remember that scripture? We read it. Work out your own salvation with fear and trouble. Well, it's almost deceptive to hear it said that way. Because who's in you? God. So you and God in you work out out your own salvation. You don't work it out yourself. Well, if I don't speak half-truths anymore, I'll, say, I'll be more saved. And if I don't get angry a lot, then I'll be more saved. No. No. Got it. No, no. God's the one that's working. Right? God's the one that's working in you. Right? He can do exceeding above anything you can think, so please don't limit him by your thinking. If you can do, Lord, help my, one of my prayers is, Lord, help me with my thinking. Help, help me not to get in the way of what you want to do today, you see. And so when I meet with him, I spend a good, about a good hour meeting with him. But it goes so quick, I, you know, I'm weeping and crying and Kleenox boxes are flying and all these good stuff is flowing. But listen, work out your own salvation. Philippians 2, 12 and 13, look what it says. Therefore, my beloved as you have always obeyed, as in my presence only, but not also in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now look at the next phrase. For it is who? God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So you and God work together and he brings you out of yourself. 
You are in a cocoon called your flesh. And the real you is inside. So I'm looking out through my peepers at you. And so as I walk with God, God brings me up out of myself and transforms me or transfigures me. And little by little as I walk with him and I show myself to be faithful by being exposed to him, he'll bring me out of myself and there won't be any hindrances in my mind or in my flesh to keep the power of God from just taking out. You want to know why those disciples were so blessed? Jesus took the time to teach them how to strip themselves down of themselves and how to allow God to build themselves up the way he wants you to build. You'll find that in Matthew chapter 5 in the first, I don't know, 13 verses. Where first we've got to come to the end of ourselves. We've got to soften. We've got to be meek. Then we've got to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Then the first thing after that is we show ourselves to be merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. Huh? And then it says, because now that you are like Jesus, blessed are you when you perse you're persecuted. <laughs> Jesus said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. So why are you trying to live to impress people out there? Did you know that those, listen to me carefully. I'm not, I have lots of people, my relatives are not saved. But I know when I go to visit their house, they could turn on me at any moment. So I go prayed up. I go bringing Jesus. And so I go and have a great time. And then, then they can insult me or whatever. They, I used to have my uncle used to uh, give Jesus the bird. You know, thank God I got saved finally. But he used to do that just to irk me. You Christians, see how I can irritate you. Bring it on. Let's see how I can wrap you around yourself. Well, I talk to your heart where your head's so crazy. Amen. Listen, after a while, I'd say after 45 years of seeing some of the best and some of the worst, eh, we're almost out of here. Can you say amen? amen? So, we need each other to build one another up. We need to realize that God is working on us. We're under construction do yourself and God a favor. Stop trying to figure it out. Say, Lord, get me out of the way every day. Get me out of the way. Get me out of the way. You take charge. I'll follow. You take charge. Get me out of the way, Lord. Get me out of the way. And, and don't feel bad about that. Because Satan has worked all your life to misprogram you. Some of you suffer with what we call insecurities. You hate yourself. It's normal. I hate myself too, but this is not the real me. So it doesn't feel bad when I lay it at the altar. <laughs> and you know what? A dead man you can't insult. I used to live with a wonderful lady. But everything was my fault. You know, when you love Jesus, it doesn't matter. Because you know that's a lie. And, you know, if somebody says that you're this and you know you're not that, why would you let it bug you? Exactly. You know how many people make stuff up about me? Because I get under their skin. They say, hey, I can see that you haven't been praying today. <laughs> I can get under their skin too. But the thing is, Christians, we're not supposed to be irritating one another. We're not supposed to be sitting back in our armchair and be a warrior and tell everything that's wrong with the church and, and, and pick the church that you want to go to instead of the one God wants you in. Okay, so we see all that. So he's working the works, right? He's doing the deal, but you work with him so he can bring you out of yourself. Listen to this. Colossians 1, 28, 29 says, Him we preach, talking about Jesus, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man, this is what I'm doing, in Christ Jesus. To the end, I also labor, Paul says, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. God is working in you mightily. Don't put him on hold. My next point, go and do good. You think you can handle that? Say amen. Some of you have already been doing that. You do that all the time. 
You go help people. You, you love people, you know, and then somebody hauls off and kicks you. But don't take it personally. Just keep on loving, doing good. Jesus says, go into all the world and what? Preach the gospel to every creature. I even preach it to my birds. I go, hey, bird, birds. One's called JJ. The other one's called Poppy. Poppy is the father of JJ, and Mommy flew away. So we have JJ and Poppy, and they just have a great time. And then we'll get out and be singing, we be the Lubbard family, and they'll go, hey, and they're totally tone deaf. But I want to tell you something. All the animals, all the things that were created from God can recognize God in you. Romans 8 says that all of creation groans and waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's you. As we transfer out of ourselves and become more like Jesus Christ, your birds, your flowers, peach trees, all kinds of things are going to start flourishing. Why? Because there's nothing evil that's in you, coming out of you. You crucify it daily. You walk with Christ daily. You're filled with love. The only thing you're going to have to do if you're a single woman or a single guy, you're going to have to knock the flies off you because they'll be totally attracted to you. And if you're married, you don't want bad. <laughs> Most attractive, just listen to me. Most attractive woman that could ever be is a godly woman. Most attractive guy could ever be. It doesn't have to do with your looks. Is a godly man. And folks, Paul the Apostle, he was a godly man, wasn't he? Four foot nine, uglier than sin. Scars all over his body for all the beatings and the bruisings that the church gave him. You see, it's not the outward look, is it? It's the inward look. Great. You are Charles Atlas inside of you. Inside of you is almighty God. Now, I, one of my last points. Remember it says exceedingly above what we can think or ask? Remember? So we got this giant living in us. His name is God. But here's the problem. He has to leak out through our squidgy mind. <laughs> if you think he can, he can. God comes in cans, not can'ts. I can do all things through Christ. So the mind is a constrictor or a valve that can open. That's why we put our mind in the word so it opens to allow God to flow out. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you may prove what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. And my last scripture, I think it's my last scripture. All right. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Would you go there with me? Everyone say, as long as God exists, as long as this earth exists, there will be seed time and harvest. In other words, listen, you have three realms. You have a spiritual, you are a spiritual realm, you have a soul realm, and you have a physical realm. Spirit, soul, and body. Each realm has its seed. So what you do spiritually is going to come back on you spiritually. And being as you're born again, you know it's going to be good. So when you give out from your spirit, out of your words and stuff, in love, you give out good things. As you sow, so shall you reap. You want more love in your life? Give out more lovingness. You need more finances in your life? Try tithing. That's the only place in the Bible that says where God would step on the devil's head for you with your finances. Be a tither. You have some time to step out in faith. You really do. Well, then and if maybe you're, you're locked into a place where you necessarily can't. Don't get under obligation. Just do what you can, but do it in faith, believing for, that you could one day. You see, we always put limits on because we seem to measure ourselves up with something that's so vast we can't ever measure up. So will you stop doing that? And just accept God has embraced you. It says, come, walk with me. I will teach you the mysteries of the universe. Now, any volunteers want to walk with Jesus? Put your hands up. Any volunteers? Then I want to see you in church. I want to see you learning. Come ask me questions. 
This is where I live. You ever called me up and said, hey, Carrie, you got an hour this week? I could sit down and pick your brain? Why don't you do, the, do those things? You have every right. Well, no, we're going to wait till you get real busy, Pastor. <laughs> and then we're going to what? Hello? No, ask questions. And don't think yourself more than you should. All right, moving to the last. Do good. So, here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will reap. So, as you sow, so shall you what? Seven. So let each one give as he's purposed in his heart. Not grudgingly, I got the hiccup, sorry, and or of necessity, for God loves what? Yeah, man, well, I tell you what, when it was time for the offering, we should have somebody like Diana stand up and say, it's giving time, giving time, giving time is here. Oh, what fun we love to give, giving time is near. Hey, right? Is that how we look about giving? Well, that's not what's say. You know, Satan wants you to hold on to your stuff, you know. All right, just kidding. So this is, a, this is scripture. Do you believe scripture? All right, so I just want to love with you a little bit. So God loves a cheerful giver. Verse 8 says, and God is able to make what? All grace. All grace. Not a little bit of grace. Not just a squidgy. All grace abound to you. What? You become a giver and God will dump grace on you. But you got to take him at his word. You got to get past your head and the lies the devil tells you. Don't do something foolish and throw it all into the wind. Be guided by the Spirit. Say amen. amen. And then he goes on and he says this. God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things, boy, that covers it, doesn't it? May have an abundance for every good work. An abundance. Peaches, anybody? We practically gave them all away to the neighbors and everything. But next year, I'm thinking about putting up a table and getting some vegetables for Eastern Washington. We'll have a little thing here for our neighbors. I want to do things like that. We want people who will come and join and do things like that. Amen? Instead of building up some big temple in the name of the pastor. No. We want to touch our neighborhood. I want God to say, well done, good and faithful servant, Carrie. You, had, you were faithful over a little place, little church. I will give you much. If I can't be faithful over you, I have no business having a large church. Do you understand? All right. And finishing. We are to be a pattern of good works. Say a pattern. You can tell somebody if they have a demon, there'll be a pattern of the same thing. A person that has a demon that causes lying, there'll be a pattern of lies. Yeah, there'll be a pattern. Satan does patterns. Patterns. God does things pattern. He made, he made the temple in the wilderness according to his pattern. So when a person under demonic influence, they will have these patterns that will constantly, even little children, little patterns. They are not getting the attention. They'll tear apart something. Little patterns. Watch for it and take authority over it, moms and dads. No big deal. But adults are the same way too. Certain people are just dumb going to be dumber. They don't bother to change. Don't put somebody like that in an office. Where your life is at stake. I'm a businessman. Last thing I want is somebody who doesn't know how to run a business running my business. Amen. Hello? And we put people in offices who are no, not anywhere trained. I probably got to my training about when I was 40 years into the ministry. Do you understand? But I knew a bunch of stuff. Got a whole period of people saved. Trained up at least four or 500 ministers in my short stints. You witnessed that. 
We have people here, still here, who followed me way back then. What's wrong with you? All right, finishing. Pattern of good works. So let's see what the scripture says. Titus 2, 6 and 7 says, Likewise, exhort the younger men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. And in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, and incorruptibility. Say that with me. Incorruptibility. We live in a world that is terribly corrupt. Titus 2, or excuse me, Titus 3, 8 says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm and constantly remind yourself, that those that have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable for all. Then finally, Titus 3.14 says, And let our people also, all of us, learn to maintain good works to meet urgent need that they may not be unfruitful. So say this with me. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I'm filled with God and good works. Teach me, Lord, how to put them to use. Teach me, Lord, how to tap the wisdom from above. And teach me to be kind to other brothers and sisters. Would you give the Lord a praise today?